go ahead and get started, I guess. So thank you everyone for hopping on today. Um, those of you joining us on YouTube Live, welcome. And everyone here on Digital Samba, we're happy to have you here as well. Um, this month, our Grease Thief Thursdays are going to be covering the topics of wind turbine monitoring. So um, I'm going to go ahead and let Rich get started. He has a little presentation prepared. And if you have any questions, um, feel free to drop them in the chat, leave them in the comments, and we'll get those answered as soon as possible. Great, thanks, Abby. I'm going to do a screen share here, uh, take it into a <clears throat> presentation that I've put together to kind of walk us through the process. Um, so just uh, confirm for me once I do this that uh, I'm sharing uh, my screen with this PowerPoint. Look good? Thanks. All right, super. All right, so I want to uh, talk today about uh, wind turbine monitoring. Um, and specifically about the data that we can utilize from uh, from the grease lubricated drivetrain uh, bearings. So um, when we look at wind turbines, historically, uh, most wind turbines have uh, been designed with an oil lubricated gearbox as a key feature in the drivetrain, uh, but then accompanied by numerous grease lubricated components, including the main bearings, uh, supporting the shaft, um, the main shaft that uh, connects to the blades uh, or the hub that the blades connect to, and then three blades, each of which has a, bear, a bearing that would uh, allow that to pitch and rotate as needed. So three bearings there, uh, one or two main bearings. Then on the other side of the gearbox, uh, having the generator bearings. And then finally, the yaw mechanism that'll uh, steer that around. And, and we'll talk, too, about how the designs are changing as uh, wind turbines get larger, and particularly in offshore uh, applications, uh, where a lot of these larger, you know, where we're getting up to 10 megawatts and larger designs, that we're uh, seeing some of those designs go away from the gearbox and then just have a direct drive. And in that direct drive now, yeah, really uh, the grease uh, condition becomes even more critical uh, because the entire drivetrain in that case is grease lubricated. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the benefits and why would I want to sample and analyze greases from wind turbines. Well, one consideration here really goes to the new grease testing before we ever put that into a wind turbine. And just the knowledge that not all new greases are clean. Um, you can't filter a grease. Uh, those who operate wind turbines know that uh, uh, a lot of the uh, gearboxes, the oil lubricated gearboxes, will have filtration systems on there uh, designed to remove particulate, uh, the damage that that particulate can cause and get maximum life out of that. But you can't do the same with grease. You can't filter it out. So the initial cleanliness from the container, from a grease gun or an auto luber is really very important to get long life out of these bearings. Um, and then, you know, so we might want to test our new greases and our greases uh, that we're putting into the gear, into the grease guns and to the auto luber reservoirs. Uh, for in-service greases, warning signs are evident in the grease prior to failure. And there's actions there that can be taken to minimize the damage. Sometimes if we find things early enough, uh, we could flush out uh, the offending contaminants, let's say, uh, or when the, the problem is the grease itself, aging greases or greases that are broken down uh, or have been mixed uh, with uh, incompatible products. So we find those early enough through sampling and testing, we can rec re uh, rectify that by uh, flushing out the old grease and its particulate contaminants. And, and putting those bearings back on track to long life. Uh, and then also, uh, you know, even if we've got other methods that we're utilizing uh, to monitor the degradation of bearings over time, um, grease adds another dimension to that that allows us to get down to the root causes of these failures so that they, we can systemically address that um, because we don't wanna be in a cycle of uh, less than optimum life of our components and just catching them right before they fail. We wanna understand what caused that. Uh, we wanna be able to fix that. And that, that goes to understanding the condition of the lubricant, the contaminants in the lubricant and other root causes that could be leading to failure. So starting with sampling, 
Uh, this is not uh, a simple thing to just uh, be taking for granted or overlooked. Uh, actually, sampling greases is a, is a bit complex because greases tend to be uh, what we call heterogeneous. What that means is that uh, unlike an oil sample where oil is flowing around through the machine, getting uh, mixed around and so forth, and we can take an oil sample and kind of shake that sample up, uh, grease is just going to have the particulate uh, that's being deposited in it where it's being deposited. And it's very difficult to redistribute that. So um, getting a representative sample is really important. And then getting a volume that allows us to focus in on the areas of the machine that have that representative grease is also an important consideration. So we focus here on some methods that allow us to monitor grease lubricated components with a very, very small volume. The methods come originally from an ASTM standard, D7718, which itself has been proven in wind applications. Uh, AWEA, which is um, an organization that's been replaced now by uh, Clean Power, American Clean Power. Uh, AWEA did come out with some recommended practice guidelines, the 800 series uh, for, for O&M uh, condition monitoring. And um, these standards included several for sampling, uh, 812, uh, 813, and 814 addressing uh, sequentially the main bearings, the blade bearings, and then the generator bearings. And then also a, 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 a recommended practice guideline for the analysis that gets done for that found in recommended practice guideline 815. Now there's been um, some changes, obviously, as, as the organization has kind of changed from AWEA to Clean Power. I was just at the Clean Power conference a few weeks ago uh, and sat on the committee, the O&M um, uh, guideline committee uh, for, you know, for American Clean Power. And um, we're now in some discussions of, of revisiting uh, these recommended practice guidelines. But if you have them historically, have access to them, uh, or just looking for that information, it's something that the, there was a peer review process uh, kind of involving OEMs and, and practitioners uh, to kind of settle on what are the right ways to be sampling these components. So you don't have to go it alone. You don't have to kind of try to figure it out on the fly. Um, there are these guidelines out there. Um, both from the ASTM side of the house, as well as the specific considerations for getting a good sample from uh, wind turbines. Um, you know, when we uh, get these samples, what are we going to be looking for? Things like contamination, compromised lubrication. Um, and, and once we find them, we want to trace them to the source. Uh, is it uh, a poor um, uh, labeling of graces where we're getting the wrong thing? Is there uh, lack of attention to how they're being stored so they're being contaminated or maybe overheated or otherwise compromised before they ever get into the machine or is the contamination making its way in uh, after it's in the housings within the wind turbine so we can look at all these things we can also look at the wear levels uh, and then we can compare those wear levels to similar equipment typically we're talking about within a particular wind farm because you've got different uh, local conditions that would be shared by one wind farm. And it could be things such as, you know, wind direction, wind buffeting, uh, wind changes, uh, the the type of atmosphere that you're in, involved with there, whether it could be, you know, high desert with a lot of uh, uh, particulate uh, getting airborne and getting into these areas. It could be uh, near shore or offshore applications where you have concerns about water and in some cases, uh, salt water. So you can look for all these things and, and then um, kind of see what is the standard, what is the normal condition, and where are my outliers within a particular wind farm. And there are some no new tools that are available that help us to get into some of these locations. And, you know, the wind, the wind industry and, and wind turbine design is not a static uh, thing. You know, we, we, we talked about the, the, the increasing size of some of the offshore applications. And so the designs are changing. And so we can continue to evolve and use the tools that are out there to get into these different access uh, locations, size openings, and so forth. We have everything from kind of a standard, what we call standard grease thief T-handle that lets you into some of the larger openings. And then a, a what we call the grease thief slim, which was designed to get into some of the 
the smaller openings. Art Miller from uh, at the time with EDF uh, was talking about specifically some Mitsubishi uh, wind turbines and how some of the main bearings there had very, very small openings. And so we worked uh, with Art's uh, uh, limitations there uh, to apply this Grease Thief Slim design that would actually fit into the very small openings there and be able to get samples uh, from those locations as well. So, you know, s sampling is something that needs our attention, needs to be established up front, but there's tools, there's solutions, there's guidelines and standards. And uh, if we incorporate those into our approach, we can have a lot of confidence in the representative nature of the samples uh, that we're taking. And then we look, uh, what is the value then of grease analysis? Um, how, you know, what is the, the return on investment? And that, that has to be a strong consideration here. We're off, often operating with, with, with small margins when it comes to grease, uh, wind turbine maintenance and so forth. So, you know, the screening analysis of an entire wind turbine uh, twice a year, let's say, uh, could be done for uh, less than a couple hundred hours a year. And that's based off of sending off uh, screening analysis uh, for these locations. And we could be talking about up to 14 different samples, uh, you know, it's maybe seven samples twice a year to completely monitor that. So it's, it's fairly, um, fairly modest in terms of the outlay. Um, you've already got the resources up tower doing inspections, doing other maintenance activities. Uh, we grab the samples while there. The kits that we have are, are very, um, you know, purpose built, very compact. All the tools required for the job can be put into a small box uh, and taken up tower. And um, so very little added uh, effort and cost uh, to get this data into the decision process. And some problems uh, can be corrected up tower. Uh, so that saves money. So some of it can be just pulling the grease sample, inspecting and so forth. And in a few minutes, I'm going to show you some tools that could either be uh, set up uh, at the base of the tower <clears throat> or at the, you know, the, the powerhouse or an office or a mobile truck or whatever to do a number of field tests uh, that can even uh, give us some quantitative uh, values based off of the samples we're taking on site. Because as those of us who've worked uh, on wind turbine maintenance know that a lot of cost comes from, uh, you know, some delay, having to make a second trip back, a second climb and so forth. We want to learn as much as we can while we're there. Um, single failures uh, can be very, very expensive when we talk about downtime, crane rental, uh, replacement of the components, replacement power and so forth. So we could be talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars per event, but we can take this feedback from grease analysis and use that to optimize the lubricant use. And that's also going to save money. And what I mean by that is, you know, the, the, whether it's auto lubers and more and more of the installations are, are coming through with an auto luber setup. So, you know, the, the periodic up tower trips are just going to make sure that we have a reservoir that's large enough, has enough volume of grease in it, but rather than have to, you know, manually add all that grease, there'll be some sort of automatic delivery system. That system has to be set up. It has to be, you know, kind of calibrated and programmed uh, to deliver a certain amount of grease on a certain interval. And we tend to try to be conservative in that regard. And by that, I mean, uh, be on the safe side. And that usually means over lubricating just uh, just to you know, put plenty of grease in. But if we test and we analyze the grease, we can optimize that those delivery uh, amounts. And what that means is there's less grease then that has to be carried up tower to refill those reservoirs. There's less uh, throughput and waste. Sometimes the grease ends up on the blades or on the, the side of the wind turbine. And in some areas, we're very sensitive to the appearance of the wind turbines. The cleanliness of the wind turbines can actually affect power generation. And I learned a lot of that when I was working in Denmark with some researchers there. They definitely have a lot of pride. Uh, the, a lot of the wind turbines are in areas where people observe them. And when you have grease leaking out and getting on the white surface uh, of the wind turbines, it's, uh, it's not seen as a positive thing. So we can work to really fine tune and only have to deliver the grease that's necessary to protect these components and ensure long life. Um, 
So, so that's certainly, uh, you know, in there with the value um, of, of the process and investing our time and resources and getting and analyzing samples. Um, <clears throat> it may seem like, yeah, just grab some grease and send it to a lab, but, but grease is different. It's what we call non-Newtonian. And, and unlike oil, oil sampling, we can't just uh, suck it out. We can't just put a vacuum or stick a syringe in somewhere and try to suck the grease out. Grease doesn't move the same as a liquid would. And what we might get with those efforts could be uh, extracted from the grease itself and might not be representative. So there is this background where these standards have been developed um, you know, over 10 years ago and incorporated into some grease sampling research done in Denmark with a Denmark offshore wind industry group that included, um, which, which, uh, which was Dong Energy at the time, which is now Ørsted, um, Vattenfall, um, and, uh, and Covey, uh, another engineering research group there, uh, and some work that's done in the Electric Power Research Institute as well. And so we have these, here's, you got the listing that I mentioned before, uh, RP812 for main bearing sampling, RP813 for blade bearings, and then 814 for generator uh, bearing sampling, all part of those AWEA recommended practice guidelines. Here's a picture of the, the tool handle that's used. It's mentioned in some of those sampling methods. It allows um, uh, us to set the depth. So basically we're coring a sample. Remember, we don't we don't suck the sample out just because of the nature of grease, but it's almost like taking a soil sample, a core sample. And really the piston that you see here is kind of held in place while the, the body is moved forward into the, uh, the, the, the body of the, of the sampler, the grease thief. It's moved forward into the machine and grabbing and extracting that grease close to those moving parts. And that gives us that representative sample. In the wind turbine application, this is an ideal solution for taking main bearing uh, samples through access plugs or generator uh, uh, bearing drain chutes, where we can kind of angle it up underneath the, uh, the gravity drains that we find in the generators. And it's helpful for us to kind of work backwards into that bearing cavity, make sure that the sample we have is representative of, of what's going on now not something that's been kind of working its way out of the machine or has been covered with dust from the outside. We really only want to be reacting to the analysis that, that represents what's happening in the bearings at this point in time. So you can see here some of the development over time, some, some up tower work here to develop tools uh, to take uh, that sample and the grease flow through the bearing is, is dependent on temperature and the bearing movement but we can use this grease thief T handle to capture this live zone grease, which will give us a really good picture of what's going on. Here's a, another earlier example of a T handle and a grease thief going into, uh, again, a large uh, main bearing uh, underneath the shaft area to get something that, that truly is re representative, not the grease that's smeared on the outside that you see here, but, but a cord sample that comes from the inside of the sealed part of the bearing uh, to give us that, that real-time picture. So we talked about blade bearings, talked about generator bearings. You can also uh, take samples from the yaw gear area or the, or the, or the yaw bearing support area. Uh, generally, we see this less often, but there could be some issues uh, in some models, some areas, some applications where there would be uh, some interest in taking those samples and maybe even in optimizing uh, the delivery rates of the auto lubers that you typically find on the yaw bearing uh, setups. So this low cost screening uh, gives us some key parameters that we can quickly test while we save the majority of the sample for future testing if needed. And this low cost screening can either be done at a laboratory or in some cases on site. So the on site ferro cue that I'll show you in a moment and the grease leaf colorimeter can be used to test grease conditions and the bearing wear or the gear wear for the yaw in under five minutes. So it's a pretty quick turnaround. We get a numerical value. We can make some decisions uh, off of that. The offsite uh, analysis um, could include, you know, FTIR um, in addition to the color and the ferrous debris. And we're talking about under 30 bucks a sample. Uh, easily including the sampling tools, the consumable sampling tools that we showed earlier. And here you can see these are actually samples 
that were taken using the furrow queue uh, from a number of wind farms uh, from one particular operator. Um, there's such a scatter here in the amount of wear that's found in these man bearings that the data uh, had to be presented in the logarithmic graph. And you can see that as you look at the y-axis. But there's some, there's some clear data clustering uh, that finds uh, some really strong outliers. Uh, these are all similar uh, designs. Uh, you had a few way off to the right that, that skewed low, quite low in terms of uh, wear concentration. But just to the left of center of here, you can see that there's a group of wind, wind turbines that's consistently producing very high levels of wear. And that can lead us towards a couple of things. Number one, this could actually be related to the grease delivery rate. The, maybe the auto lubers are not set properly. Uh, they're not flushing grease through often enough, and you're getting this very high accumulation of wear. There could be a design issue with the bearings in those locations. There could be uh, ingression of contaminants that drive up the wear rate through abrasion and fatigue wear. Um, and it could be something about the way those particular um, uh, wind turbines are being operated too. So, you know, the, the amount of time on the grease over time, wear builds up and so on. But it's the kind of data set that allows you to, to, to focus in and not just kind of sit back and wait for the next major problem to manifest itself as overheating or severe vibration levels. We can kind of get ahead of this and use the data to, uh, to find the outliers and address them, especially when you've got this kind of clustered information that says there's something uh, systemic about this particular population that we can address, get to the root cause of, and work to, to address proactively. Here's some of the uh, sample test kits that are available, and you can see um, that these kits here for wind turbine applications come with instructions. You see those instruction cards there. You also have uh, the sampling kits uh, well protected uh, in, a in a sealed sleeve uh, until, you know, you're up tower at the location. You know, you have the opening uh, ready and you're ready to take that sample because um, if we contaminate the samples or the sampling tools ahead of time, uh, that really skews the data so we can have a lot of a lot of uh, confidence in the data when it's presented uh, with tools like this uh, we supply these kits with barcode labels uh, that allows you for that uh, unique identification we also have a an, a an app that can be done online or on a smartphone uh, to identify the, the sample location link that to the barcode and it eliminates another problem that's seen from time to time and that is uh, labeling problems labels falling off or or, or handwriting that's not legible or misinterpreted. Uh, if we just link that straight into a cloud-based database, which is what our navigator system is, and it gets linked definitively to those barcode labels, that really gets rid of some of those uh, mis miscommunications and data problems that are sometimes seen. But we can use a statistical analysis of the sample groups and, can, and, and make a comparison to limits for a data set. And that helps us implement some proactive improvements that can extend the grease life, but also extend the life of the component. And this is a big consideration in the kind of the financial aspect of wind turbine investments. And that is, you know, are we going to get 20 years of trouble-free life out of these components? Are they going to start uh, having issues at 15 and 17 years? And and, and it's, it's a huge impact to whether um, an investment made in wind turbines is really going to return on that or not. So, we're often at the point where the, the damage has propagated through and we're, we're pulling out damaged parts. It's often too late to recover from that, but we can be proactive with grease analysis, find these indications early, change practices, change grease, um, you know, do things proactively to, to really try to hit those numbers on, on the expected life, reliability, and performance of the wind turbine investments. So here's the first tool that I'm going to share with you. It's the furrow, furrow Q. It uses an inductive coil that measures the ferrous wear content in parts per million. It um, <clears throat> One big improvement of this uh, over the early versions uh, is that it does measure samples up to, to 200,000 ppm. If we look back at this uh, graph back here that I showed you a moment ago, uh, you can see that uh, there's plenty of applications where these concentrations can go up significantly. So some of the other 
uh, perhaps um, ferrous type tools out there might give you something up to about 10,000 ppm, 15,000 um, is, is quite common. Um, it's often important uh, to be able to see it at higher levels just so we can uh, quantify and prioritize our actions. Uh, there's a very low uh, uh, standard deviation to the values that are produced for this. Um, it measures small and large size particles. That's really important. Some of the oil analysis lab techniques are only looking at smaller particles and is kind of blind to particles at the, as they get larger, but this is not. This will see these larger particles. And another differentiation for this technology is that it will um, be able to quantitatively and accurately represent uh, particulate that's not evenly distributed through the grease. And so you can see that that grease thief sampler right there. It's the it's the tool that we're using to pull that sample in the field. We don't have to manipulate it. Uh, we don't and, you know, we can't shake it up. Uh, so this this device is going to represent that concentration regardless of where it's found in the grease. And we've done some comparison to other tools out there and, and some of them are, uh, you know, will will not uh, will not accurately represent that. So this is really important. In fact, there is a there is a what we call an interlaboratory study uh, that's uh, the data is being uh, churned right now for the ASTM standard on this. And it, it really shows this tool to be uh, a clear uh, outlier in terms of how accurate it is and how repeatable the results are, uh, even for uh, kind of unevenly distributed particulate. And that's sometimes what you get. You just get a handful of really large particles. You want to be able to see them and take action based based off of them. So um, very helpful tool. And in a moment, I'll actually demonstrate that here with some samples I have in front of me. Uh, you might notice the, 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 the logo on here for Poseidon. And folks who work in the, the wind industry might be familiar with Poseidon from their series of uh, oil sensors that they've designed for wind turbine gearboxes. It, we went to Poseidon and uh, knowing their uh, expertise in this space said we need to have a sensor that can measure, you know, basically the particles as, as they're going in and out, uh, not just uh, just what uh, some of the particles uh, are doing to a coil here. And um, we work with them over a, a extended period of time to get a, a device that would really be focused on uh, getting good results for Greece. And that's what we have here. So uh, for those of you who are familiar with them or maybe even already working with Poseidon, there's even some talk about uh, integrating this device with a Bluetooth uh, hookup to the Poseidon data uh, nodes so that it can automatically uh, associate that data with, with your equipment. But for the most part, we're talking about having this in a laboratory setting or on a vehicle or maybe back in the office to uh, to produce wear levels. <clears throat> and uh, it works uh, when the, the, the sample, the, the, the grease thief is, is inserted into the opening of the instrument. It has this inductive coil technology that's going to detect all those metal particles as the sample is in, inserted, whether they are at one end, in the middle, concentrated at the back end or evenly distributed it's going to count them all which is really what we need for you know quantitative and trending purposes um, results are displayed right on screen there and then you have that uh, communication uh, capability uh, can integrate like i said with Poseidon live or we can export it out to a csv or even to an app and uh, the whole thing runs off a of 12 volt dc power so we could even hook this up to a vehicle uh, with the, with that power to, to be able to use this in the field uh, as well. And then there's the Grease Thief colorimeter. And this is something that we've designed and it detects the darkening or changes in color due to grease aging and oxidation. Uh, we can also see evidence of grease mixing. Um, and that's why some, you know, because a lot of these greases are, are, are dyed different colors for identification purposes. And you can see those color shifts using this color spectrometer. Um, you could also see the accumulation of, of, of certain contaminants. Uh, it can work with light and dark greases, and it's uh, less than a minute uh, to analyze uh, a grease uh, using this technique. Now, one of the, the key things is, and we can say, yeah, I can look at grease and I can just look at its color. But what we find with grease is that the relationship between color 
and changes in the grease or 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 contaminants in the grease is very much a function of how thin that grease film is that we're looking at and so you'll see in this device it actually squeezes the grease to a precise thickness that we're going to use each time when we run that spectrometer and that's really going to give us a basis for comparison and actually have a a spectral uh, analysis value a spectral data value relative to the new grease appearance where we can create criteria for this we can say these are outliers no these greases look the same as they do they're looking fine there's obviously no changes here uh, but find those few that have changed and then nominate those for further analysis because then we can say so what's causing that color change is it and we can use tools like um IR spectroscopy that look at the different bonds. We can look for evidence of mixing of the wrong type of grease. We can look for different kinds of contaminants being there. We can look at the antioxidants in the grease to see whether they're oxidizing and getting to the end of their life. And these, these things go towards optimization of our grease and our regreasing cycles, all uh, being triggered by the colorimeter. So you can see here the, the output of this device. You've got a, a minor change. You've got left and right halves of this display screen. And on the left is the reference of the new grease and what it looks like when it's thinned out uh, in the measurement. And then on the right, you have only a slight change on the first one. And then as you look to the example to the lower right, you can see an example of severe oxidation where you get that color shift that happens as grease oxidizes. And there's a numerical value here so you can see like less than 15 for the delta e values for the first one is it's really within an acceptable range but then you've got a delta e value of over 40 uh, when you have this severe grease oxidation taking place um, we talked about you can do it with lightly colored and more dark greases and we accomplish that uh, ability by changing the thickness of the film that we measure and we use this delta e value uh, for our criteria. So just some examples out there of data that we've done. You know, here's a particular wind farm and we took a kind of a cross section of a section of the farm, uh, wind turbines uh, 46 through 67 in this case. And, and again, we've got a kind of a um, uh, logarithmic scale going on on your Y axis. Uh, but you can see most of these values are falling, you know, well well below or well within about a 1000 2000 ppm range but three of them here are are well above that uh over 7000 10 almost 10000 and above for three of them and two of those are over 100000 ppm so as i would look at this as my wind farm you know instead of just kind of you know generally saying uh well let's today let's look at 46 47 and 48 and tomorrow we'll look at the next ones i know that i can i can focus right in on tower 47 and you know 52 and 53 as as being ones that that obviously are outliers here and 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 let's say i've got a problem with one of these that has me bringing in a crane um you know i'm probably at a very minimal minimum uh, taking the effort to do a boroscope inspection on those bearings and I'm likely finding that uh, you know for the for the time and effort of having the crane out there I want to do multiple towers at that time and that's really going to save a lot of money uh, on the deployment of, of uh, you know the uh, cranes uh, to, uh, to to pull bearings let's say if that's indeed what we find when we do the inspection and here you can also see the colorimeter difference. Again, I said like that 10 to 15 uh, change in appearance uh, or delta E values on the color is is, typical, is, is is pretty typical, but you've got a couple outliers here with a very strong difference. So it's it, there's almost some visual indication going, in here, on, going on here that we can put a number around uh, for the colorimetry uh, work. So you find with these examples here, three of the 22 samples need further analysis at the lab, the other 19 wind turbines, are good to keep regular maintenance schedule sample again in six months the greasing frequency seems to be right on the mark here and all this information is going to save that customer time and money for getting quick and reliable results that can also uh, then be trended so two main things that we've talked about today are on the the sampling side of things as well as the analysis piece on the sampling size side there's the tools that we shared and we looked at the kits 
that we have available as well as the reusable tools that, that marry up with those kits where we're pulling that that one gram uh, grease size for analysis and um, and having a lot of confidence in that. And and this is where we can work with you depending on what the configuration of the particular bearing is, what the accessibility is. We'll often work with folks to, uh, you know, let's look at some photographs or some drawings of the configuration of these bearings and see if there's a plug, an access hole, whatever, uh, to use a combination of the right tools uh, and the right technique to get that representative sample, whether it's inserting that whole grease thief into that opening or going with something like the grease thief slim, which is a much smaller uh, diameter uh, down a little bit closer to a, a quarter of an inch uh, of clearance. And, and we're inside there and getting a representative sample. The second piece then being the analysis. And really today, just kind of focusing on this idea of screening and uh and the tools that are available so that you know an operator <clears throat> you know and you know we we engage with folks who are kind of long-term uh operators of wind farms or maintainers and then sometimes we're we're dealing with folks who are in the end of warranty and they're trying to do an assessment maybe all at one time because an entire farm is you know coming up at the end of a warranty period we're pulling all these samples together this can be a, a real good way to screen through them and know where we need to focus uh, by by going through and, and take doing these screening tests. So whether that's something that someone would want to do on site, have that immediate feedback, or send off to a laboratory for analysis, that that support for for screening testing could be there. Um, so at this point, I'm going to try to uh, going to drop out of the, the screen share here and pivot around. I'm going to get out of that. Pivot around and use the camera. Uh, to show up my little setup that I have here on the, the testing side of things. So, um, and I've, I've been showing kind of this grease thief, which is the, the sampling tool and what we end up with when we take a sample. And on the left here, I have the, the ferro cue on the right, uh, the colorimeter. And here I am in a, you know, just in, in my office, uh, I could be in the little powerhouse or, you know, the office area for the wind farm, or I could set this up in a, um, in a, in a, you know, a van or something like that, uh, and our work truck and be able to take this, uh, information and get immediate results. So here's the Faro Q. I'm going to pivot this. I'm going to see if this helps a little bit with the screen to maybe see that a little bit better. Um, a little bit of glare there. Maybe it was better in this position. I don't know if, uh, You'll be able to see this. It's really clear to me. I just don't know whether the camera is, is picking this up or not. But very simple process. It's kind of in a sleep mode right now. You have a sample opening. It's inside here where this uh, coil is going to be that we talked about, this induction coil using that uh, Poseidon technology. And you can see that I'll, I'll take a sample here. You know, the first thing we notice is, uh, you know, we, we take a couple samples. You can see some differences here in appearance right off the bat. Uh, appearance can be helpful, especially if you've looked at a lot of things before, but it's, it's, it's not, a, not not always sure exactly what it means. So I'm going to drop this first one in, and that should uh, uh, wake this up. Let's see, it might take a moment to, to get a response. But once, it, once we get this rolling, um, you can usually get um, these going pretty quick in just a matter of uh, seconds to get a response out of the unit. It'll give us a number in parts per million, and I'll, and I'll let that go for now. And then the other part of this then is to take um, the grease and use it with a spectrometer. Now, if we if we focus on the spectrometer for a minute, I'm going to connect with my uh, smartphone here, and I've got uh, this is going to be. Yeah, I guess it's a little too bright. Let me see if I can bring this down a little bit. It helps seeing that on screen. There we go. So if you recall this, this shape that we had here um, that, I, that I showed you on screen, this is what we're going to display. And I can scan a color. I'm going to start by connecting to the NYX. And I can see it's got a Bluetooth connection there. And I just want you to look at this sample area right here because I'm going to do a scan. And when I hit that button, you can see that light come on. And what that light is doing is it's shining up into this space. It's actually trying to reflect off of this uh, Teflon disc. 
And in this case, it's, it's wide open, so there's not a lot of space come back. It looks black because it's not really seeing the light that I put in there. But what I'm going to do is then take this off and uh, take uh, my, my sample here, remove the cap from it, and put that right down on this surface and just push down on the handle here and just put a little dab of grease on that surface uh, on the spectrometer window, if you will, and then place that into position. And what you're going to see now is that I have the ability to push this down and squeeze that into place. So a couple things that I'm doing here, I'm going to open uh, up the app again. And I'm going to switch this to uh, a comparison mode. So I've got a compare right here. And now it's split that into two parts. So I pick the left side. And from this, I go to a saved color that corresponds to what this new grease looks like. And so you can see here, here's what the new grease looks like. And then to scan the other side, I'm going to say scan with Nix Pro. So first thing I do is push this down. And then I say scan with the Nix Pro. I tell it to take a reading. Oh, it's got to connect again. And then that should turn that on. And there's my reading. Okay. So you can see there's, there's quite a bit of difference. The grease... The appearance of the new grease versus the grease sample that I just ran coming out of this particular sampler, I've got a values here, and it says that my Delta E2000 values is 38.3. And remember, I said something like about 15 is pretty normal. 38, that's significantly higher. There's been a pretty significant color change here, and so this may exceed my criteria that I have to now evaluate that particular grease because there's been a significant change in its color. Um I'm going to remove this one here. You can see that it did give me a, a low value. Uh, this was the, the brown color grease that I tried. I'll, I'll do this again, and uh, <clears throat> it should give me another response here. It got a PPM of around 52 for that particular grease. And we'll let that drop in. It's processing the sample. Okay, so here we go. This says 55,000. So this one here, and it does really correspond to some numbers I had on there. That's one reading. You know, you grab another grease here. Uh, let's see. It's going to have to reset, but we'll get another reading. So it's going to give me that numerical value. So between the colorimeter that I have here that's comparing to the new uh, grease, what the new grease looks like, and I can, you know, either do that on the fly or I can create a library. You saw me retrieve this SKF grease from the library for this one and then this darker grease here. Um, that gives me that part of the story. And then the second piece uh, is here. Let's grab another one and we'll drop this one in. And we're processing that sample uh, significantly lower, 8,700 versus, you know, that, that earlier reading. So it, it doesn't, it's a darker grease, uh, but darker doesn't always mean that there's more wear. There's a, there's a reason for the color to be different. And that's one aspect of it. The other is the amount of, metal debris that has accumulated and um they're two very different measurements so there's 56,000. so it's like almost like a factor of, you know almost a factor of 10. so quite a bit different so i wanted to share these things with you and uh just let you know that these tools are out there the tools to get the sample the representative sample uh as well as um the these field units that you can deploy and, and get that kind of short turnaround time uh for that so this is really what I wanted to try to cover with you today. And um, I want to circle back to Abby. Abby, did you see any questions come up or, or any issues that, 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 I, that, that I should address? The comment I saw was that Poseidon is awesome from Eric Robertson over on our YouTube live. We, we do have some, some support for Poseidon over there. But otherwise, um, I, think, I think we're good. Okay. Um, yeah, and I guess everything else was just like, um, housekeeping things or getting people connected and whatnot. The other comments that came up. Yeah, you got it. Mostly, mostly logistical pieces. So, okay. So, good. so things look good on, on the live stream, I guess. Um, oh, we did just have a question come in from Paul. Paul was asking if we offer any trainings. Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, so we, we have a training coming up, um, you know, next month, right, Abby? That's uh, the eight. We have uh, actually two training classes in April. 
upcoming classes are in April. We have one coming up um, in Pennsylvania right here at MRG Labs. Uh, and then we have a second one coming up. So the first one's April, the week of April 17th. Yeah, and, and I think you might have just got muted, Ab. So it's like April 17th, and then uh, there's one in uh, Canada as well. And that's the following week. Um, and that's with our friends um, from, from SDT, right? Okay, I don't know. Maybe maybe I lost the, the sound here because um, I'm not hearing any any comments. I think there's a microphone issue. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Thanks, Dylan. 17 to 21st. Is that one? The second one. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can now. Yep. Abby, you can use my microphone. Oh. Sorry, guys. Some technical difficulties. Give me one second. So our first training, like we said, is going to be April 17th. Um, that week, and it's going to be right here in York, Pennsylvania. And then our second training will be April 25th to the 28th um, up in Ontario in Canada. So hopefully we can see some of you guys there. Yeah, and the, and the Ontario one's with the folks at SDT uh, Ultrasound. So we're going to be at their facilities and, and meeting our friends up in Canada at that time. Um, and these are both um, what we call MLT training classes focused on machinery lubrication technician training or the certification uh, for that. Um, but we do also um, get into things like grease sampling, grease analysis. Um, for the class that happens here in York, we will have hands-on opportunities. We will have the instruments that you saw here as well as the additional instruments in the laboratory that would be the follow-up testing to these things. Like when I was you know, showing you here, I had 156,000 parts per million. That's something that we might take and do analytical ferrography on so that we can see exactly what are those particles. And this, this is really helpful in the wind turbine application because you know, there could be different failure modes or different wear modes, I should say. And understanding what they are can be helpful. Um, fretting wear is a problem that's seen in some uh, wind turbine applications. And this is more of a contribution of when the wind turbine is not running than when it is. It's when we have uh, a, a stationary, maybe with the brake on, uh, but there's still high winds kind of buffeting that, that can create that shattering. So if you can differentiate when you have, say, fretting wear versus a fatigue wear mechanism, when the fatigue wear is caused by particulate versus the age of the bearing or overloading of the bearing, all these things are really helpful in, in answering a question, what do I do about this? Because if we take the effort in a wind application to have to replace a bearing, we don't want to put a new bearing back into the same conditions and, 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 and get right back into a, a similar failure mode. So digging into that next level can be very helpful. So those are the, some of the things that we can, we can share with you uh, if you come to that training class, uh, come with us in the laboratory and see these kind of things. Um, and so for some folks, that might be a good, good solution. All right, Rich, that's great. We do have another question um, from Eric over on our YouTube Live. The question is, is 100% grease sampling across an entire wind fleet necessary if you have vibration monitoring as well? Wow, great, great question. So here's the thing about vibration monitoring. There's different ways to do it. Um, there's different systems out there, um, some of which are coming with uh, the original design. Uh, of the wind turbines. Uh, others are being added later. Um, some are using uh, 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 certain techniques that are specifically designed to get into uh, early detection of some of the low speed applications. Uh, and in other cases, they're maybe not as sensitive to that. But what I always say about, you know, the complementary nature of lubricant analysis versus say vibration analysis or ultrasound or some other technique that someone's using, is that you, you want to accomplish a couple of things with your monitoring strategy. And that is to be able to get early detection of issues regardless of the failure mode. And there are failure modes that vibration will pick off right off the bat. Things like, 
things like misalignment, uh, things like um, an imbalance, okay? Those forces will immediately manifest themselves in a detectable value in the vibration analysis. There's other things that will lead to a bearing failure, but vibration only picks up the damage that happens somewhere down the line. So if your problem is that you have particulate getting into the grease, maybe external particulate or the grease supply is not great, that has to go through many cycles, fatigue cycles, to damage and actually displace material from the bearing. You, you have to have the pitting process to start before you would pick that up with vibration. Um, so again, there's not, not like one technology is better than the other. Um, it really depends on the, the, fail, the wear mode, I should say, the wear mode. Um, and, and that's why they become very complementary. The other thing about the dimension that you get from grease analysis that you may not get from vibration analysis is the why. Okay, why do I have vibration? I know I've got damage. I, I, I can see impacting. I could see, uh, you know, inner, inner race ball pass frequency. I get very precise about what is happening to that bearing, but I might not answer the why. What's the contributing factor? And sometimes the answer to the why is in the grease itself. It's a, it's a chemistry question. It's a makeup question. It's a de de degradation of the grease. So by putting these things together, they are very complementary. And I think from a cost perspective, a lot of folks are going to rely on vibration as being that backstop, you know, that across the board thing. So to go back to, to Eric's question, is it 100% grease analysis required? Maybe it just depends on your maintenance strategy and when you want to be able to intervene. And if you're just looking to catch the late stages of failure, then bearing the you know vibration analysis is going to pick that up and maybe you find those high vibration situations you complement them with a grease test and you better understand the why part of what got you there but if you want to be very sensitive and very proactive you really want to pick up these different failure modes some of which vibration won't pick up till later in the damage cycle and in those cases grease analysis can be very complementary to vibration analysis Awesome. Cool. Yeah. Eric had a follow-up comment there. Um, he said they're using Onyx Eco CMS and Fleet Monitor, um, which was designed around wind turbines and their slower rotating speeds. It really is. Onyx, is. Onyx has been at this for quite some time. And, you know, they, they I believe, kind of came into this space because some of the OEM solutions really weren't picking up uh, some of these slow speed indications. And so that's going to be really helpful. Um, and so I would say that, 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 that kind of system is going to be better than a lot of systems, but I'd still look for, um, that other aspect of things as, as a, as a modern program will mature and we're trying to gain as much information as we can and maybe be very proactive in our process is to complement that even a system like that with grease analysis, which will give them us more insight to changing properties of the grease, the contributions to the onset of damage from you know, that we would get from looking at the lubricant. Awesome. Sweet. Uh, we have another question from Darina. She asks um, about how to distinguish grease mixing from oxidation with a colorimeter. Yeah. So, so, so great question. So it's part of that depends on how much information we have as we look at things. And so what we can do, let's, let's say you're in a wind farm where you're using two or three different kinds of greases, which is, which is, Quite possible, right? Think for a moment about what we're trying to lubricate. We're trying to lubricate a high-speed shaft in the generator, and then a low-speed shaft in the in the main bearing, and then you know basically non-moving or barely moving uh, bearings in in the blades. So you could have two or three different kinds of grease to be optimized for those applications, and they may look different. They may have different colors. And so what we can do in that situation is baseline each of those so that now we get a, a lot more insight into the color and we can pick up those differences. You can, because the values that you get are actually looking at color vectors. And so we can say, well, this grease is basically the same color as it was. It's just getting darker versus another sample. Actually, the vector has shifted and we now have the hues of a different grease. And you might even be able to compare it to those other greases and from the color itself say, uh, somebody grabbed the, the blade bearing grease and they pumped it into the main bearing. Or there's a generator bearing uh, grease that's into the, the blade bearing grease or whatever the case may be. So if you know more about 
the color spectrum of each of the greases that are potentially being used in the application, you may be able to tease those things out. On the oxidation side, it's typically the starting color of the grease that's slowly changing over time. And it's actually a different parameter um, that you're measuring, uh, which is uh, which is kind of your black and white or basically the the color intensity or darkness versus lightness uh, vector in the color. And you can pick that up as it oxidizes. So the only thing that really makes it definitive, though, is that you screen for color. And when you get those outlier conditions, you do the follow up uh, with laboratory analysis that can look at the antioxidants, their concentration, but for oxidation um, peaks showing up in the grease or clearly fingerprinting your greases and seeing where the mixing is coming from. Sweet. Thank you. And I think maybe in a similar vein, Pierre Luigi asked over on YouTube Live if there, he asked, are there many different types of grease in a single wind turbine? Or yes. Uh, well, yeah, I went to uh, some conferences a few years ago and there was there was folks standing up and saying, we have the universal uh, wind turbine grease available. <laughs> and, um, you know, you look at that and, 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 and scratch your head a little bit because um, it's it's a it's a complex machine that has very different requirements for grease. Like I said, you've got high speed and low speed. And when you get into high speed applications, when you're trying to lubricate high speed applications, you're generally looking at low viscosity base oils that will generate that protective lubricating film. And you get into lower speed applications, you mean to need a much higher viscosity uh, oil to, to have some effectiveness when it comes to what we call elastohydrodynamic lubrication. There can be additives in play in, in, in these different situations as well, but generally there's at least two and sometimes three uh, different, very different applications if you mix in the, um, the yaw bearing uh, and, and, the, and the gears for that. So it's potential for different components and four different optimized greases, but I would say at least two and three for most applications so that we can get the right combination of base oil chemistries, base oil viscosities, as well as additives to, to really protect those components for the long term. All right, awesome. Looks like that's all the questions we have on uh, both the live stream and on um, YouTube Live. So I guess we'll wrap up there. Rich, do you have any final questions or final final thoughts? No, I I just thank you, Ab, Abby, for for getting us a set up today and helping to uh, to coordinate this and to to lead us through the process. Um, we're going to be doing uh, this in the future, right? You want to comment on that at all? What we have planned for coming months and in future Greasy Thursdays, and maybe the opportunity for folks who are interested to request other topics or other focus areas for us. Yeah, of course. So. Uh, Greasy Thursdays are going to continue happening every third Thursday um, of the month. And so this month, obviously, our topic was wind. Um, April 20th is an upcoming uh, next month. We're going to be talking about lithium complex greases, um, a hot topic right now. So looking forward to that. And then another one coming up in May um, will be reliability and sustainability in lubricant analysis. Um, so you can go ahead. We actually have a link online to a Google form. You can register in advance for those. Um, I know some of the people on the call have already registered for future Grease Leaf Thursdays, so we'll look forward to seeing you then. Um, but you can also find that on our LinkedIn or on our website. Um, there's a bunch of ways that you can get connected with, with that form. So, yeah. Yeah. Can you drop that link into the conversation here, Abby? And then um, folks can get a, get a look at that before they, before they sign off. And yeah. uh, maybe we can put that in the comments of the saved YouTube video. And that's the other thing folks can use uh, the link that they use to get into YouTube live to show this to someone else later, right? You got it. Yep. This all will be uploaded into our YouTube channel. And so um, I can also share that link as well. Great. Well, thank you. And thanks for all the folks that joined us today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next month. But if between now and then you've got questions, uh, just call us here, just email me, reach, reach me uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, call our office here at 717-843-8884. Uh, we'll be happy to help you with uh, any questions around wind turbine lubrication, grease sampling, or grease analysis. Thanks, and, and we'll see you again soon.